mentioned, um, our company one to one. I just like to briefly explain the name of the company. It's, uh, the meaning is twofold. On the one hand, um, the desire, uh, the, the scale that we desire to work at, obviously at one to one, and then also the um, the service that we provide, obviously from the translation process from the digital one to the real one. And as Alan has said. Um, I guess you could say I'm a homegrown uh, person. I studied here at the uh, Architectural Association some half decade ago. Um, and uh, especially uh, being a student of uh, the intermediate unit number two, Charles Walker's unit. And um, I guess uh, that had uh, quite a, a profound impact on, on the way that I work now. I, I think you can see it also in the work, if you know the, the work of the intermediate unit two here school uh, some time ago. I guess on the one hand, um, what I learned was uh, to um, this sort of belief in, in, the, in the power of, uh, of digital computation and, and digital fabrication. On the other hand, also profound respect for the kind of craftsmanship that the builders that you're working with. And, uh, and um, this is where our company comes in, being cent uh, centrally located in, in the center of Germany. And here you see a, a small map of uh, the country um, and some of the workshops that we've already collaborated with. And obviously, we might know there are some very um, traditional craftsmanship workshops in Germany. And it's uh, absolutely a pleasure to, to find them, to work with them, and. Um, Elaborate. Uh, I think uh, everyone is quite hungry already, <laughs> so I'll try to make it brief. I'll just quickly run through uh, four reference projects. Um, the Alpha Harmonic, uh, which I had already worked on as a, an, an, an employee at Herzog in the Wall, and then the, as a consultancy um, also on the project, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, the Philharmonic in Paris, and then a small museum project. Uh, Museum near Frankfurt. The first project, uh, the Alphanomonic, um, is definitely the most complex, the biggest project that we are working on, that we are still working on, that we have been working on for the past. And unfortunately, during the, uh, due to the um, current stage of the process uh, of, the, of the project, uh, I'm not allowed to go into much detail. I can only show a few images that we, uh, we also put on our website just for you to get the kind of sense of what we are, have been involved in and what we are currently involved in as well, in the, the large concert hall. Essentially, the uh, acoustic, uh, the sound diffusive acoustic pattern, um, which we uh, developed the programs to generate uh, according to the designs of the architects. This is not too evolution. Um, I won't go too much into detail, essentially being a, parametrically defined uh, surface, which um, had to be applied to all the acoustic relevant surfaces. It illustrates uh, also responding to the acoustic requirements. Uh, as you can see here, an acoustically relevant surface uh, in the back turning to a, a relevant surface in the front of the walls. See the reflector, the ceiling, uh, and so on. And in total, we had to generate close to almost one million cells, uh, which we had to do in two months, which is quite a daunting task. But um, uh, unfortunately, this is all I can tell you about this project at the moment. We're also working on the, on the fabrication and the actual construction at the moment. Second project I'd like to show you is a. Uh, well, two projects that we uh, worked on, two architect large-scale architectural models for, for Jean Nouvel, and we really uh, enjoy working on these large-scale architectural models because on the one hand, they are large enough as models uh, so that um, a traditional model maker couldn't uh, actually build them, but they're small enough so that we can actually uh, control the entire process, the entire uh, digital fabrication process down to the last school. Um, Beginning from you know, starting from from the initial um, data that we get, 
uh, from from the engineers in this case, Boro Hapot. Um, um, as you may know, we live in Abu Dhabi. The design of uh, Jean Nobel. Um, the idea is to create this rain of light effect, as he calls it, and it was actually um, recommended by the light engineers, Hans Solar from Germany, that they built a large-scale prototype of this model, uh, of this building. Um, Large-scale means uh, more than a scale of 1 to 33, which is uh, still roughly 6 meters in diameter. This being the only uh, image that we received from the well. Uh, and but also uh, after we, we got the contract, uh, the data that we received from Rapa, which already had obviously a, a very uh, good logic um, built into it. But uh, as I mentioned, the uh, model at this scale is still large enough you know, to take uh, certain things into consideration. For example, the structure. Um, made out of aluminum and being only supported at four points and steel um, weighed about a ton and the architects were very keen on seeing a very straight edge um, which we had to guarantee that uh, the tips would not sag so we had some abstraction analysis uh, done on it and the internal logic of breaking down the structure into smaller elements and, and, and modules as, as we call them also taking into consideration the construction and uh, sequence and logistics, which uh, we had to um, take into consideration that the model was supposed to be pre-fabricated pre, uh, pre in Germany and then shipped into parts quite quickly to Abu Dhabi to be tested on site. And uh, we started uh, developing the details, obviously the, the uh, the structure that we received from Burhapot uh, was only a center line model with um, diameters indicated, so we came up with this kind of knot and uh, the member system, which we defined geometrically uh, in order to generate it once uh, using um, a plugin that we developed for Rhino. Um, you can see here a small section of the model more detail of uh, the actual prototype, prototype of the prototype, if you will. Some empirical tests as to <laughs> uh, checking whether the structure will hold up, and it was actually quite um, quite strong. At this point, we were still using aluminum for the knots as well, which we realized were a bit too soft, so we went uh, on to use uh, stainless steel. And once we tested uh, the concept on a smaller piece. We also uh, started to think about some type of rationalization. So in, in this case, we had uh, roughly 15,000 elements, which uh, we wanted to break down into uh, standardized, standardized parts according to the length and the diameter of each of the uh, elements. And uh, I won't go into much detail, but we managed to break them down into roughly 44 standard elements, which obviously uh, was quite um, a boon in terms of fabrication process in terms of speed and cost, obviously. And uh, so we prepared the drawings for, for the elements, the knots, which were to be laser cut, which were all nested and um, and uh, obviously labeled, and you can see here the knot uh, had an address, and also the neighboring knot's address uh, engraved on it, as well as the uh, types of members which would connect the length and diameter of the members. <laughs> obviously, we had normal type knots which were laying, were laying in within the surface of the dome, and the diagram ones. And once all of the data was prepared and uh, ready for fabrication, we, we ordered them. Uh, they came in um, to two shipments. See the knots on the left, and the on the right. Which means they had to be sorted first. It was, uh, we, we actually told the laser cutter to 
don't throw them into a big box, but obviously they did that. So we have to <laughs> sort roughly, I think, the month is roughly 5,000 elements or so, which then uh, were pre assembled using one to one printouts, the lower cord, and then the upper cord, and then the diagonals. Then assembled on a huge MDF jig, also to control the kind of tolerances that uh, you would get. And as I, as I said in the beginning, this, um, there's actually a carpentry workshop which assembled it, and um, as Fabian has said, they have uh, machines which work to a precision of one tenth of a millimeter. And I actually asked one of the carpenters, so what kind of measurement can you still see with your knife? Five, ten, <laughs> so they were actually working very, very precisely, and uh, we actually only had about one or two millimeters uh, tolerance from one edge to the other edge. You can see the structure. Uh, the edge had to be um, to be welded. Structure. Again, the center, is, this is all pinned, um, mechanically pinned, and uh, this is sort of an edge beam which is welded to act as a sort of tension ring. Uh, the area around the supports being more densely uh, welded. And then once uh, that was finished, the whole structure had to be lifted up to be clad. Here we see the first uh, cladding elements. And uh, that was another challenge in itself, but uh, we managed to to water water cut them. Uh, also, out of aluminum sheet, they had to be uh, pressed into uh, spherical shape in order to get the smooth surface. And they were um, they were assembled with a gap of I think about five tenths of a millimeter, um, which the architects obviously were very scared that you might see them at the end, but. As you can see, it's actually quite a smooth surface. And then we had one sort of testing, pre-testing campaign in Germany still. Uh, the delegation came to see the model, the, the client, the architect. And uh, then we had John Berkin himself, because he wanted to make sure that it's, it's a presentable structure because it had to be presented to the in the shape of century. And uh, that was a bit of um, an event when he <laughs> waved his hat underneath the dome to catch the light beams. And once that was done, about two or three weeks later, the whole thing was disassembled, shipped to Abu Dhabi by airplane. Then uh, we assembled it was, uh, also where this one to one mock-up is standing, which was presented to the press. And then also our model, which uh, was uh, placed on the card, which we also prepared for it to be brought in and out uh, of this warehouse used for the testing campaigns. And some press work. <coughs> and, um, and the original idea for this model, as I said, it uh, was just a testing model for the, for the light conditions and uh, they actually managed to, to achieve this with, some, uh, with a second uh, series of alterations. Um, we had to prepare a second type of cladding, but um, uh, it, it worked a bit. So I go quickly through this project. It's um, another model which we prepared for for Jean Miguel, which was an acoustical test model um, at scale 1 to 10. This was also done in the carpentry workshop at the moment. This was more of a um, half and half uh, modeling and uh, some kind of scripting work. Um, we just had to make sure everything was airtight, not too heavy because it had to be. Assembled on location in Paris, 
building on the, on the second story of a, of a container building. So we had to make sure every extra little weight was taken out. And here we see the roof, the outer hull. Um, so the series of construction, the outer structure, and then and the cladding of the inner hull, and then assembly on top of the model. balconies, which also had to be prepared. So there was enough material for the sound energy to reflect, but uh, not too much uh, to make the model too heavy. So that was a bit of uh, a pain to actually meet all the requirements of the acousticians. Um, here using the 5 x milling machine to prepare the sheets to glue them together and, and the surfaces again. Assembled, lacquered, and uh, shipped off to Paris, and uh, all the dimensions have been taken into account. Because, uh, as I said, this model was then reassembled in Paris at the site of the Philharmonic here in Parc de la Villette, uh, in this uh, second story of uh, this um, the temporary building, and everything had to fit through one of those panels. Which they removed the two, I think. So we had to make sure all the pieces were not too big. As they were shipped to Paris, brought into the building, and then assembled, uh, ready for the acoustician to do their testing. And obviously, the architects say, like, it's. Uh, it's sold to the client as a scientific experiment, but uh, obviously it's also uh, a nice tool for the architect to work with in terms of uh, determining the architecture. And here you can see all the different locations where they will actually put temporary microphones to test uh, the reverberation climate at uh, different locations inside the hospital. It's quite an interesting uh, uh, process that we go through, but Last project, which was um, uh, the furniture essentially for uh, a museum, a Celtic museum um, in a small town close to Frankfurt, where we um, also worked again with the carpentry workshop Ackermann to prepare the substructure and the cladding, which the cladding is made out of leather. Um, the substructure out of MDF just. <coughs> You see also the number of parts, right? seven parts. And so I guess this is kind of uh, standard procedure now. It's just like we do this really quickly, and we have all the tools. And uh, over the years, obviously, working with this carpentry workshop hand in hand, we have developed a lot of uh, details and uh, sequences, uh, like these little connector pieces, and how to. So we have some. Uh, some tools developed to do these projects fairly quickly. Um, it looks maybe much simpler than uh, it actually was, but uh, obviously to handle such such large amount of elements and um, having to take into account um, <coughs> uh, yeah, uh, exhibition boxes and, and speakers and, and cables that had to go everywhere. A bit of a logistical um, nightmare. But everything was then reassembled in the workshop to five to ten of a million <laughs> precision, I suppose, and then reassembled on site. So the finished point it looks much simpler from, from the outside. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, okay, so if we take a short break, uh, 